Good morning, it's Jeffrey Christian of CPM Group. It's about 9.15 on Tuesday, the 8th of February here in New York. Gold's trading around 18.25, silver's around $23. Uh, we wouldn't be surprised to see a little bit of weakness in the next day or two, uh, but then we think that with the uh, CPI numbers coming out Thursday and Fed report on Friday, we could see prices move higher. I think we're talking about 23.50 as a nearby near-term target for silver, and um, around 23.18.30 for for gold. I wanted to talk today about gold and silver in a cashless society. And the reason I I, I picked this topic is that two days ago or three days ago now, uh, after our Friday video, uh, Fritz Bender posted the comment, Jeff, would you would like to know your thoughts about the push for the great reset and cashless society system. Uh, he thinks it's going to be the a modern gulag archipelago and uh, lead to social scoring and crushing the common man beneath the wheel. I disagree with him. Uh, I think uh, I can't really help him too much. Uh, he needs much more than uh, he probably can get from me, but let's talk about this. And, you know, specifically, I want to talk about what a future cashless society might be or mean at this time and how it might shake out. Talk about some of the facts and some of the misrepresentations. You've got a lot of um, conflict entrepreneurs who are catching on to this and talking about it. You've got people who pretend to be ex-CIA analysts saying that, you know, they've been saying for 10, 20 years now, oh yeah, they're gonna, you know, take away all your money. Uh, and I wanna talk about that in what, you know, it's something of a misnomer. You're really talking about what the future of cash is going to be, but we'll get back to that. And then I'll talk about what monetary authorities see as realistic futures for cash. Uh, and then we'll get into this whole issue of the great reset, which again, um, is kind of nonsensical, but the conflict entrepreneurs have latched onto it. And we'll get into that a little bit more um, and then talk about gold and silver in the society. Before I do that, a little show and tell. This is a picture of people pouring whiskey into a sewer during prohibition. Prohibition was brought in by a Republican administration and they went door to door looking for liquor. I think uh, some of you may remember that I told the anecdote about my grandmother being a bootlegger. Uh, she was a widow who spoke Italian and had four young children, and she supported herself by making wine and selling it. And the police came and arrested her, and since she had four children and no one to take care of them, they put my my 10-year-old mother and her younger children uh, siblings in, in, in jail with their with their mother. That's how they treated prohibition. And there's a big myth, and God, it keeps going on despite the fact that anybody can go to a library or go online and find the history about the great gold confiscation. And you find conflict entrepreneurs and fear mongers and snake oil salesmen still talking about how government's going to come and take your money, the government's going to come and take your gold. And it behooves us to understand, A, the differences between 1933, when about 25% of the world's wealth seems to have been in gold, financial wealth seems to have been in gold. It was a significant, critical, large part of the financial system. It was actually somewhere between 25 and 33% of the financial wealth was in gold. So it's very important to now when it's less than 1% and has been less than 1% for almost half a century, right? But the other thing is to understand what really happened back then when gold was important. Roosevelt won the election. He was sworn into power in early March, 1933. That's when they had the inauguration back then. They changed it after uh, the 30, 1932 election uh, and moved it into January. And the first thing he did when he got to the White House was close the banks, declare a bank holiday, and restore confidence in the banks. Uh, and that was like March 5th. 
And the next business day when they reopened the banks, there were long lines outside the banks of people looking to redeposit their money and gold that they had taken out of the banks during the first four years of the Great Depression. And the election of Roosevelt, as divisive as it was, restored confidence in the government's ability to restore the economy. And people were redepositing money. Now, he said that he was going to call in the gold coins in circulation and gold certificates that the US government had issued. But he didn't issue that statement, calling in the gold, until April 5th about a month after he had been inaugurated. And the Treasury estimated they had about 58 million ounces of gold coins and gold certificates in circulation that they had issued up until February 1933. They estimated there were about 28 million ounces of gold, mostly in coins, in circulation in the United States. Between the beginning of March and the declaration the government decree, Executive Order 6102, the fear mongers love to tell you, between the, the inauguration and the actual issuance of that government decree, Americans turned in 40 million ounces of gold before they had to, on a voluntary basis. No treasury executives or federal officials going house to house, office to office, going through bank deposit uh, boxes or anything else, all voluntary. I have gold, give me money. 40 million ounces out of 58. Another 4 million ounces were turned in after the decree before May 1st, and then another 2 million ounces trickled in later. So the treasury got all but about 8.2 million ounces, which they said most of that was probably exported, and it was. And some of it may have been lost. And again, uh, private individual Americans could continue to own a certain amount of gold coins as collectibles, uh, numismatic coins. So the only there was one person who was arrested for defying the decree, and that's because he wanted to be a martyr. And they said, okay, yeah, you want to be a martyr? Well, yeah, our government's very accommodating. Come on down and we'll put you in jail. Uh, the entire process was based on voluntary surrendering of gold, and people did it. And about 83% of the gold was handed in. Yeah, so contrast that to prohibition. Think about what they did then and what they didn't do. They basically sat there and waited for people to bring them their gold. And if they didn't, no big deal. And think about how unimportant gold is to the monetary system today. So that's a little bit of history. I got a little bit more. Now, the first thing is, what is a cashless society? And that's a misnomer. The question is, what's the future of cash? I brought along some show and tells. This is a, about a 12 penny nail, circa 1880, 1881. Here's a two penny nail. And here's a three penny nail. It has steel, iron actually. They were used as currency. This was cash back in the day. About the same time, here's an 1878 silver dollar. And it's interesting because it's worth about $30 as a collectible right now. So for those people who say that silver is going to $30, I got a piece of $30 silver. But here's an even interesting one. This is a 1927, excuse me, 1928 peace dollar. And those of you who are numismatists know that in 1928, there was a situation where the treasury only issued a few of these. So this silver dollar, one ounce, is worth about $500 right now. So all those fear mongers and snake oil salesmen who keep telling you that silver is going to $100, $500, $50,000, I got a $500, ounce, uh, $500 piece of silver. This was cash back in the day. 
cash back in the day. This is a silver certificate, which we took out of circulation in the early 1960s. It's a dollar bill, but you could, and it was issued, importantly, it was issued by the US Treasury. Uh, one dollar, it says it on the Treasury because it's very important, uh, the difference between Treasury notes and, and Federal Reserve notes. Um, you can take that down to a nationally chartered bank and exchange it for an ounce of gold, uh, a silver, silver rather. So that was cash. And it's, I, I, I show you the nails, I show you the coins, I show you the bills, because what cash is has continually changed. We don't use a lot of bills now. A lot of people use credit cards or they use their phones or they use other devices, Venmo and whatever. Uh, and on a global basis and on a large scale basis, it's electronic chips. And it's been electronic chips for, for almost half a century now. SWIFT, which was created, I believe in 1972, um, and is many, 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 many times more secure than cryptocurrencies, by the way, in terms of transferring. The incidence of loss and theft in cryptocurrencies with distributed ledger protocol is a multiple of the incidence of thrift, uh, theft in thrift, SWIFT. SWIFT's been around for about 50 years. Uh, and actually, I, I, guess I think this is the 50th anniversary of it. And it has uh, largely replaced cash. Okay. So it's not a matter of moving to a cashless society. It's a matter of moving to digital cash and making sure that digital cash is secure. And that's a big important point because one of the things is what do monetary authorities see as realistic futures? And, you know, uh, the U.S. government has come out with a report recently, last month, about uh, the potential for digital dollars, uh, and, uh, and other central banks are looking at it. They're looking at it because it's the future of cash. It's the way people are going. You know, economists used to joke about, well, how is it on Star Trek that these guys live pretty good lives? but they don't even carry wallets. I mean, you know, their uniforms didn't really show any bulge where a wallet might be. Um, and they they went around the, the, the universe uh, with no cash, no credit card. How did that happen? And, and the writers of Star Trek actually came up with a, a theory about how people got fed up on earth with all the shenanigans going on with currencies and they just sort of got to a point where they got rid of it. And that actually goes to the whole issue of the Great Reset, uh, which we'll get to in a second. But, you know, the reality is that cash has continually changed in terms of what it is. Uh, you could argue that goods and services that were bartered starting back in, you know, pre-medieval pre time was a form of cash. Uh, we did have coins back in BC times. Uh, BCE times, uh, and nails started being used as currencies at least as early as medieval England, uh, which is where the whole denomination of one penny, two penny, eight penny, ten penny nails came from. It related to the value of nails. Um, so monetary authorities look at how people spend money, how they save money, how they spend it, how they carry it. They look at what's been going on over the last 200 years in the transmogrification of cash. And they say, what's going to be the future of cash? And let's move toward that. And let's think about it before it happens, because a lot of times when you plan the changes, you can deal with the changes a lot less uh, painfully than if they come upon you unsurprised, oh, as a surprise. Now, these are utopian visionaries through the ages. Thomas More, he kind of lost his head. Sorry. 
uh, he was executed for his utopian visions. Henri de saint simon he's a cool one. He got so depressed that his utopian visions never happened, that he tried to kill himself. He actually shot himself in the head six times, attempting suicide, and failed. <laughs> kind of reminiscent of some of the people who criticized me. <clears throat> shot himself in the head six times, trying to kill himself, and failed. Wow. And then John Humphrey Noyes, who was an American utopian. And I bring these guys up because it's at the heart of what Great Reset is. To understand the Great Reset, first off, what was actually said. It's a term that was coined by the World Economic Forum CEO, Klaus Schwab. And Klaus, I was going to put a fourth picture here. I was going to put Klaus. It's a kind of a utopian idea that he has of a future society. And it's very similar to what the writers of Star Trek came up with back in the 90s, I think it was, when they had a movie about Star Trek and they come back to modern day Earth. And that's where they actually describe the transition from a society where everybody had their own money to a society where everybody worked together in harmony in the Great Federation and didn't need to carry a lot of money around in order to have their goods and services provided to them. But Klaus is something of a utopianist and the World Economic Forum is something of a utopia, an idea. Now, let's stop and say, what is the World Economic Forum? It's a place where a bunch of people get together and talk about the state of the world and what could happen bad, what could happen good. And if you look at the attendance and you talk to people who have been there, you find that a lot, there are a few people who are important, they're there. And there are a lot of people who are has been, I mean, some of the most notable attendees are Prince Charles, Bill Clinton, Tony Blair, people who used to assert, exert power or never exerted power, but their ancestors did. And then you got people like Elon Musk, kind of a musical clown in some ways, a wealthy musical clown. And then you have a lot of wannabes who want to attach themselves and be seen and meet important people, you know, and they sit around and they talk about what's going on in the world, and where it might go. They don't necessarily have the power to control it. It used to be that the conspiracy theorists talked about the Bilderberg meetings. Bilderberg was an, a society that was put together in 1954 after World War II, uh, and it was people from Europe and people from North America then they'd get together once a year for a, it was really a golfing out weekend. Uh, and they would get together and they would play golf in the daytime. And then they'd sit around at dinner and they'd have various people give talks about the state of the world and what could be done to make the world a safer place. 1954, after two world wars, after the Korean War, in the height of the uh, Cold War, with communist governments in China and Russia controlling a significant part of the population of the world, as well as nuclear weapons. And the Bilderberg people would get together at night and talk about this. And you know, it's funny because um, I lost a good friend because she believed, like a lot of people did, that the Bilderberg Society was some all powerful group of people with Roosevelt's and Rothschild's attending. And she asked me about that and I said, well, you know, they actually invited me to join. And I asked a very good friend of mine who was a member, should I join? And he said, why would you join? You don't play golf. Now, it was basically a golfing outing where they would sit around and talk about the state of the world and they'd invite people who had actually thought about stuff to come in and talk about it. And that's sort of what the World Economic Forum is, except it's skiing instead of golf. But the conflict entrepreneurs, you know, first off, they're realizing that people are 
realizing that after decades of them telling us how the world financial system and economic uh, systems are going to collapse, and it's never, those disasters never materialize, that they have to find new material. What can we use to scare people? What's the new conspiracy theory? So when Klaus said, hey, let's call the 2021 World Economic Forum the Great Reset, and let's talk about how the world's going to come out of the lockdown and the pandemic. That utopian idealistic idea was latched on by the conflict entrepreneurs, the snake oil salesmen, the fear mongers, and they've made it into a really big deal. There's no government in the world that's looking for a great reset. There's no conspiracy of monetary authorities and government leaders that's talking about what would could do to create a great reset. There are a lot of people who are looking at the state of the world and the ringer that we've been through over the last two and a half years and saying, hey, people are coming out of this thing with different perceptions of how they want to live their life. We have witnessed what we can and can't do to help people during crises. We assume there'll be more crises in the future. And what can we do to prepare for those crises? That's what the Great Reset's all about. The Great Reset is all about scaring investors into buying gold and silver at high premiums and holding it because it's there. Now, the question is, what is gold and silver? What will their roles be in a future cashless society? And I can tell you that the role of gold and silver in future cash systems will be exactly what it is today, and exactly what it was in 1933, and exactly what it was back in 1878. People will hold wealth in gold and silver because it's a great alternative to denominating all of your wealth in a pure currency. You have all your money in your, all of your wealth is denominated in the currency of your, where you live. Or if you're a wealthy person, you might have some, you know, wealth stashed in other places, or you have, might have investments or investment homes in other places. Gold and silver throughout history, 6,000 years or so, have served as an alternative asset, an alternative store of wealth, an alternative to having your wealth denominated in currency. Adam Smith said in The Wealth of Nation that you don't define wealth by how much gold and silver you have in your vault. You define wealth by how much money you have earned and invested in productive units. He, like Warren Buffett, would have been a grand proponent was a grand proponent of investing in a gold mine and a silver mine because gold and silver values fluctuate as do currency fluctu uh, currencies fluctuate. The only currency system that has never collapsed is the current one. Almost all of those previous collapsed currency systems were based on gold or silver or both. Gold and silver doesn't protect you from a currency collapse. It doesn't protect you from vacillations in the value of gold and silver, but it does diversify your wealth and your investment portfolio to protect you against the vagaries of reality. So the future, the role of gold and silver in a future cashless society is that they will still be just as important as they are today. And that future cashless society really won't be a cashless society. Cash will just be something other than a piece of paper issued by a government. It'll be a computer chip uh, issued by a government. And it won't go that way until the system's much more secure. Now, there are a couple other things I should point out. US government is talking about kicking, having, trying to get Russia kicked off of the SWIFT system if it invades the Ukraine. Kind of a good idea, but 
for the conspiracy theorists who are looking for their next thing to scare you about, it probably would be very bad for the SWIFT system. The SWIFT system's 50 years old. It's a fabulous system with a very, very, very small uh, amount of theft and mistakes and lost wealth compared to cryptocurrencies and distributed lever, uh, uh, ledger protocol, uh, protocols. It is incredibly secure. But if the US government decides to politicize it by kicking Russia off of it, it could well spell the death knell, the beginning of the end of the Swiss system. And one of the things that central banks and monetary authorities and treasuries around the world are looking at is, okay, SWIFT is good and it's lasted for 50 years, but we do have distributed ledger protocol and that's probably where we're going in the future, but we have to make it more secure than it is because what we found is that it's not nearly secure. Even Russian hackers who have been doing uh, ransomware have found that their cryptocurrencies aren't as secure because the US military has taken back some of the ransoms that they've been paid. So distributed ledger protocol has to get better. SWIFT is under risk if the US follows through with that because people won't like it. You know, there's a lot of gold and silver demand on the part of governments in 1979-1980 when gold went to 850 and silver went to $50. Part of that was the fact that the US, European countries, Japan and Australia had frozen Russian assets when they invaded Afghanistan around the world and Iranian assets when they took the US hostages and they've frozen Afghan assets now. But back in 1979, 1980, people around the world were saying, wait a second, I have my wealth in a bank in London or Switzerland or Germany or the United States, and they can freeze it, they can seize it. I think I should have my wealth in gold and silver in a non-bank depository. And that was one of the big factors that pushed prices higher. And as you know from listening to me over the last couple of years, we have a little cottage industry of helping people store their gold and silver in reputable, seemingly safe uh, non-bank uh, depositories around the world. Because that is a good way to have protection for your wealth. That's all I got today. Uh, thank you for listening. I'll talk to you on Friday.